he struck out in a game three times on the same pitch, Tony Cloninger fastballs, which were allegedly not that impressive. And he was so mortified by his inability to make the adjustment that he retired immediately after the game. It was the second time in his career, only the second time they had struck out three times in a game. And he just called my grandmother and he was like, Carm, I couldn't catch up. I'm done. Here we are again, March 8th, it's hump day, Wednesday, another mound visit, and what better day to have our first female on International right. Woman's Day, the Lindsay Barra, granddaughter of Yogi, but what a uh, accomplished woman we have here today. Um, thank you for joining us, Linz. Um so fun always hanging out with you, we're doing it virtually today, and uh, welcome to the mound visit. Thanks for having me, I'm excited to... Uh catch up with you guys oh man i can't wait there is uh there's so much that me in particular that i want to ask you about and i think um the first one is and and you know i don't know if not to i don't want to gloss over anything but you were quite the softball player back in your days i know we're i know this is baseball podcast but you were quite the softball player can you talk a little bit about about that part of your life and did and i'm, I'm kind of assuming this here but correct me if i'm wrong did, you know, growing up in a baseball family like you did, did that play any part into your, you know, your future softball endeavors? So it's funny, my grandpa Yogi was a big advocate of kids playing every sport that they could play. Um, so I grew up playing um, soccer, ice hockey, basketball, softball, you know, like just hockey in the street like not on the like you know we used to we used to set up goals across the intersection that I lived on it was a rural, like not a rural intersection but suburbs so not too many cars and you'd be playing hockey across the intersection if there was a car some kid would yell car and all the kids would dive off the side of the road you know um so I grew up playing everything and I would actually say I mean sure we were definitely a baseball household and and that definitely contributed to to me becoming a softball player, but grandpa really was the biggest influence in my life that made me play ice hockey. So he grew up um, a hockey fan in St. Louis, and he would go to games at St. Louis Arena when he was a kid. There was an American Hockey League team there, and my grand one of my grandparents' first dates was at a hockey game, and he whenever he was on the road... Um, if he were in Boston or Chicago, he was always going to NHL games. He became good friends with John McMullen, who was the owner of the Houston Astros and the New Jersey Devils later in life. And when he brought the Devils to New Jersey, Grandpa started taking me to hockey games, and I was five. And I started playing ice hockey at that point. I was the only girl on all the little club teams. Um, so I did go on to play softball in high school and softball in college at the University of North Carolina. But while I was playing softball, I was playing men's club hockey as, as well. So the hockey was always like a big thing for me. And that kind of led into my first job, which was covering hockey at ESPN magazine. So the whole sports thing influenced by grandpa, influenced by the rest of my family as well. You know, my uncle Dale played pro baseball. My uncle Tim played pro football. My dad played up into the Mets minor league system. We were all just athletic hyperactive ADD kids you know by osmosis like I said you're around it maybe you didn't glow grow up necessarily in a clubhouse but you were growing up in a clubhouse <laughs> uh, a house with the club members brought their their homework home and it, it, it definitely uh worked out well for you Lindsay you know it, it's been so fun getting to know you over the course of time and the years here um most recently uh we got to share something that added to the piece of the museum. If you haven't been to Montclair, New Jersey, where your family's all from and, and where Yogi and, and uh, your grandma all kind of kicked off things there in the United States, right? Um, not too far away, rock throw away from Seton Hall where I went to college. Uh, but what, a, what an awesome place to unveil a part of his heritage and Italian culture, be around all your friends, family, um, tying in the, the wine that's, that's named after him and branded him from Rock and Ball Wines. Thank you again. Uh, you, you know, your family was so gracious and, and uh, partaking in that and honoring him again, um, the legend that he is. So it's, if you haven't been to this museum and learning center, 
Lynn, tell us about what goes on there because it is a magnificent place. And to be able to dine and drink wine around just legacy Hall of Fame, just about Yogi, that was a memory I'll never forget. We're in our 25th anniversary year at the museum. We opened in 1998. We're on the campus of Montclair State University. And it started out as a place for us to, you know, kind of, it is a place where all Grandpa's stuff is located. We have all 27 Yankees World Series rings, the 10 that Grandpa won, and we have his three MVP plaques. And there's a lot of cool memorabilia and, you know, baseball cards and gloves and bats and whatnot. But the bigger part of it is the education component. It's the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center. My grandfather was very self-conscious of the fact that he only went to school to the eighth grade. He had to quit and work and help his immigrant family put food on the table. Um, as soon as he had enough money to do so after he signed with the Yankees, he started a scholarship fund at Columbia University back in the 50s, which still exists today. So the education piece has always been really important to him. And at the museum, we have a whole bunch of educational programs based on grandpa's values um, that we teach to kids and for us it's a way of keeping his legacy alive for uh, the next generation of sports fans of general humans who may not be sports fans we have a stem education program we have um, a couple different capsules on um, immigration diversity civil rights we have a women in sports program right now we have this really fun one on spoken word based off the yogiisms where the kids write their own poems and stuff so that's super fun but, um, you know, doing the wine with you guys was another one of these things that helps us introduce Grandpa to a different set of people who maybe haven't met him before. And we can talk about his Italian heritage, which he was very, very proud of. He was from a region called Cagiono in northern Italy, a little village called Movaio, north, uh, northwest of Milan. Um, and that's, you know, kind of highlighted by the wine with the grapes that you guys chose to put in there. And it's a real cool conversation piece to talk about Grandpa's heritage and we think it's great, and it is always really funny to me when we have events at the museum where people are eating and drinking and maybe getting a little tipsy around all of that memorabilia. I'm like, be careful, don't spill the wine on the jersey. <laughs> but, um, you know, it always works out. <laughs> That's awesome. No, it, it felt like he was – it felt like he was in the room. Uh, for me, anyways, I just, just having the Yankee game on, they were playing the Cleveland Indians in the playoffs, the, the – uh, uh, championship Yankee banner that hung over, swung over Yankee stadiums that was given to him and is now in your family's possession and the museum's possession. I mean, I, I'm getting chills again, and I'm sitting there eating a lamb chop and got Yogi wine. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. If I can't be on the field anymore, that was as close as I could get to it and and, <laughs> and be around all these things that I love to do uh, post-career. And, you know, like I said, getting to know it. If you haven't noticed, everybody, I mean, Lindsay, you're so deeply rooted and you're such, uh, so passionate about your family and especially your grandpa. I know that relationship. It's just, you seem so fond of him and the memories that you have to carry on a legacy like that. And, and rightfully so. Um, if you haven't seen the movie trailer, you know, the, the argument of like, well, he is one of the greatest living at the time when they, they were making it, when you said the four greatest living and he was excluded out of that. You had every right to say what you said because, I mean, this guy dominated the baseball diamond and is a legacy himself. He's not just a cartoon character character, like I know you defend. I mean, that was just the funny part of his character. But, uh, you know, what a guy. I would love, being a pitcher, I would have loved to hung out with him because I know I'd be laughing all the time. And he was really good at, like, making pitchers better. You wouldn't have had to think at all. You just get out there and throw for the glove. It would have been great. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun. Grant, but I, you know, I say this a lot. Um, my grandfather would have been a special human if he had never stepped foot on a baseball diamond. Mm. You know, he was the first generation Italian American. He volunteered to, to fight in World War II and ended up, you know, as a, as a 18 year old kid off of Omaha beach during the D-Day invasion. He was a machine gunner on an LCSS, Man. uh, providing, uh, Cover fire for our troops going ashore during the invasion. Um, he was wounded, shot, or a piece of shrapnel through the hand. Um, we don't know which, and never got his Purple Heart because he declined to fill out the paperwork because he didn't want his mom to worry that he'd been hurt. Um, and he he just kind of lived his life with that kind of like selflessness. And I I, I think that experience in D Day put him into Major League Baseball with a perspective that not everyone gets. 
Um, just incredibly, incredibly grateful for the chance to have come home when a lot of other guys didn't and to come home and play a kid's game for a living, do something that he loved for a living. And I think that gratitude came out every day on the field, you know? I mean, he he was such an incredible clutch hitter, and people always ask me how he did it. Well, I mean, he'd been through a real life-or-death situation. Bottom of the ninth is not that, you know? So I think he was pretty able to keep himself cool under that kind of pressure um, and, and just become such a great player. And like you were saying... Um, I do think people forget a lot of that about him because the yogiisms became so famous and because he became such a kind of a pop culture icon with all the commercials that that he did. And I do really hope that this movie serves to remind people how good he actually was on the field, because some of those stats are just amazing. There's still records that will literally never be broken. We can talk about some of them if you want, but I've been a while, so I'll stop. (laughs) No, it's it's great, and I, I I think the one of the really cool things, and I I you know if for people who don't know, um, the documentary is called "It Ain't Over," um, getting released by Sony. So this is I mean this is going to be incredible for not only just baseball fans but sports fans and anyone out there who you know who wants to. I mean documentary fans and and just just every, i mean it's going to be an incredible film for people to be able to see but can you sort of talk a little bit about a little bit more about the film itself and how it came to fruition what that process was like how what your involvement was like in that and and um because i always find it interesting to to think about the process of making a documentary and what must go into that and you know especially when you're making it about a uh, focused around a certain a certain figure um, the involvement of the family and what goes into to making that sort of a film. So we, my family, had never really thought of doing a documentary on Grandpa, but there is a guy named Peter Soboloff who had often played in our museum golf outing, and he is a movie producer. And he was dragged by his wife to see the Mr. Rogers documentary, um, you know, six or seven years ago. He really didn't want to go, and he went, and he loved it. And... He mentioned to my Uncle Dale and my Uncle Tim, you know, I saw this Mr. Rogers documentary and it was just delightful. Why isn't there something like this on your dad? And they were like, well, we don't know. We don't make movies, you know. So Peter was like, can I do this? Can I get the ball rolling? Would you let me do it? And my uncle said, by all means. And they hooked up. um, Peter had worked previously with the director of the documentary, Sean Mullen. Um, So they brought Sean on board and I met Sean and just kind of started talking about what he was planning to do. And for Hollywood folks who don't have a lot of contacts in the sports world, it became pretty clear that I would be able to be very helpful connecting them to the sports people who we needed to interview for the movie. So I got involved in, in, in that way, just trying to make sure we got Vin Scully and Audrey Graziola and folks who were getting on, on in years. There's actually four people who appear in the film who have since passed away. Um, so we wanted to get those folks done quickly. I wanted as many people as possible who had actually seen my grandfather play Um, And that was kind of how I fell into the executive producer role, like from a logistics perspective. And then I do end up narrating the film. And we had wanted someone like a Billy Crystal or someone who has done movies or narration before to do that. But when they started kind of hearing my stories, they thought it might be endearing, charming, whatever, if they had me do it instead. I'm still a little bit mortified by this because I hate listening to the sound of my own voice, as many of us do. So I apologize if anyone gets sick of listening to me, but I do narrate the movie. Um, It was a really long process. We started, I think, in like November of 2018. We had to take about an 18-month hiatus because of COVID. And then it premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival last year. And it'll be almost a full year um, since Tribeca when it's released on May 12th by Sony Pictures Classics. So it's a long process that I didn't know much about. I didn't know anything about before I got involved to do this film. That is so cool. It, can you talk a little bit about, too, because I think it was, <laughs> and you can even see it in the trailer, some of the um, the names that are in this film speaking. Uh, I mean, you mentioned Vince Scully anyone who knows baseball pretty much anyone who knows sports knows that name just an absolute icon um but when you look at some of the names in in that i said vince you listen to vince and, and that, yeah. that's an honor like i said yogi himself the legacy but the fact that you encompassed and and the, the people that you know were probably giving you christmas presents or birthday presents lens 
in this movie, players that he played with or against, uh, you know, just obviously had an a, a affection yeah. towards your granddad uh, to talk about him. Sure, I, I can't wait to see the entire. Well, that was kind of what myself. I was what I was thinking too. So I mean, you must have been able to notice how important. Like, did it kind of almost give you another? sense of appreciation for who your your grandfather was and what he meant to the sport seeing how many people were willing to to talk about him and be a part of this film yeah for sure i mean i'm gonna go back to your original question for a second casey because i do have like a a list of folks here who i was supposed to reach out to and the, the families of but so like we do have billy crystal and bob costas in the movie it was incredibly important for me to get vin scully because vin was obviously working with the dodgers when they were in brooklyn and he called on the radio so many games that my grandfather played in. So he's someone who saw Grandpa play for a, for actually his entire career because Vin was there from, from the beginning. He called the perfect game in 1956 um, when Don Larson threw the only perfect game in World Series history. Um, so that was really important to get Vin. And he was the first interview we did. Um, and obviously he's subsequently passed away. So we're, we're really happy to do that. Um, Dr. Bobby Brown is in the movie. He was my grandfather's roommate with the Newark Bears in 1946. He went on to be a baseball commissioner and to be a heart surgeon. The guy's just an incredible human being, but he has since passed away. But um, Bobby Richardson is in the movie. He played with Grandpa. Hector Lopez, Tony Kubek, who who both played with, with Grandpa. Um, we have Audrey and Joe Garagiola, um, oh. Willie Randolph and, and Ron Guidry, who Grandpa coached, Don Mattingly, who Grandpa coached. Nick, um, then when Grandpa was at spring training with the Yankees, he became really tight with Derek Jeter, Nick Swisher. They're both in the movie. Um we have some writers, uh, Roger Angel from The New Yorker, who just passed away at like 100 years old. We got to interview him before he passed away. Um, we have some stat folks, John Thorne from MLB. There's there's a lot of big names in the movie, and it is fantastic. And it is cool that all these big-name people like Grandpa, and, and it definitely gives you an idea of his place in the sport. But honestly, what always touches me the most is when you meet a random person in like a parking garage, and they have this amazing story oh i met your grandfather this one day and for the couple minutes i spoke to him he made me feel like the most important person on the planet that day and they have this nice story to share and to know that so many people loved him and when they say i loved your grandfather they mean it love in the same sense of the word um that i do when i say i love my grandfather and that's just really heartwarming and and wonderful to know that he had that kind of impact on people that's incredible like i said his legacy you know, of leadership, inclusion, loyalty, sportsmanship, just how to be an overall good person. I think we need that nowadays. Uh, there's so much out there. So to keep keep his, you know, memory alive, his living memory alive, because we're still talking about a guy who's lived uh, four lifetimes, almost like a Forrest Gump with everything that he's accomplished. Um, even his Medal of Freedom, like you said, is something that I know was um, you finally got in the museum. Um, he wasn't around to see that, but... Uh, tearjerker probably moment for your family to, to really, you know, again, uh, just to see what kind of person he is. And like you said, these stories keep coming out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I cried at the Nolan Ryan documentary. I watched it on a plane because he was a mm-hmm. person that I got to see play and and wanted to be like. Um, uh, I never got to meet your granddad, but like I said, I'm, I'm just as excited to see this come out. And I've, I've heard so many amazing stories that you've told me uh there's there's so many and uh, i'm just i'm just thrilled for you and your family to continue the the legend uh to go on here it's funny that you mentioned nolan ryan because yesterday when the trailer came out i sent it to his grandson jackson ryan who's a friend of mine and i just sent him i sent him the trailer and i just wrote we were lucky kids weren't we and uh he's he's he kind of feels the same way obviously <laughs> having nolan ryan as a grandpa um so, yeah, I mean, and it's been a great year for baseball documentaries. The Nolan Ryan one, the Willie Mays, yeah. um, PBS did one on Bill White. There's, there's a couple of really good ones coming out. So Grandpa's will just be, um, you know, another one to add to that batch. But it's great to see those kind of documentaries, like, kind of in the mainstream so folks can learn about these guys who came before, especially as, like, we're getting all new new rules and the game feels like it's starting to change a little bit to me anyway. So I like to see the old guys represented. Yeah, I can only imagine would, what he would say to some of these rules because I have an opinion about it. I would love to hear what he would say. You know, uh, 
it would be something to sit around and just be quiet and let him talk because I'm sure he'd have a lot to say about some of these things that don't make sense to him, and there'd be definitely some more yogiisms, I'm sure. That was going to be my question for you, <laughs> um, Lindsay. Do I you remember. Think that, I was. Do you think that he would have had, or maybe knowing him as well as you did, and we we've talked to to Jason about it too. But do you think that there would be some? Uh, what do you think he would think about about some of these new rules? If you had to, if you had to guess. So I remember when they made the rule about not being able to take guys out, catchers out at home plate. You know. And um, mm-hmm. him saying, like, mm-hmm. it, it was like a point of pride for him that he really never got knocked over because he was quick. And he would just say, if you can't get out of the way, that's your problem. And I said, well, what about what if someone just came in and tried to take you out? And he goes, well, he'd end up with my glove in his face and he'd be out. <laughs> so he just was very um, confident in his ability to move out of the way and not get himself hurt. And honestly, if you think about it, I mean, he played 18 years and every year he caught more than like 120 games. Most of them was up uh, the, the full 150 that they were playing back then. He caught both ends of double headers 117 times in his career. He was not hurt. So guys trying to run him over at home plate didn't really do any damage. Um, so when that rule came in, he was a little bit like, okay, whatever. Um, but no, I think he would be um, baffled by a, a lot of this, the bigger bases specifically. <laughs> but... I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Yeah, you'd say, why did they increase home plate? They don't <laughs> really basic stuff. <laughs> yeah, right? Home plate. They didn't make home plate big. Yeah. Uh, great. Well, Grandpa, you that, that would not have been about that. <laughs> Maybe you would have liked that for your strike zone, Jason, when you get a little wild. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, some days I did need a wider strike zone. If the plate was bigger, it would have helped my cause, maybe. Oh, I don't know. God. But uh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Lindsay, I have a question, too, about the – because it's so fascinating to me, and I think kind of like you mentioned, just in the past couple of years even, I can think about all of these different sports documentaries that have come out. The first one, I, you know, obviously talking about The Last Dance, you talk about, like, Michael Jordan and the way that that documentary seemed to captivate not only the sports community but, you know, the entire the entire world was watching that – and, and amazed by not only the athlete he was, but just how great the documentary itself was pieced together and put together. And then you mentioned the, the most recent Nolan Ryan documentary. I can think back to uh, one of my favorite uh, documentaries watching as a kid called Fastball um, was a great one. Did you take, were there ever, were there things that you took from maybe other sports documentaries, other documentaries in general, maybe bits and pieces or um, maybe it was some inspiration that you took from other things to um, to put towards this, or were you kind of trying to mold your own sort of path when it comes to um, to this documentary here? So first of all, I want to say, if anyone has not seen the fastball documentary that Casey just mentioned, you're missing out. That movie is a treat God. that was done by Jonathan Hawk, who is a master documentarian and, and does great baseball films, and it just it goes back and they actually used um, guys in at the University of Pittsburgh, very smart folks, to go back and measure the fastballs and try to um, equilibrate the way they measure for Nolan Ryan, for Bob Feller, for Aroldis Chapman over the course of, of years to accommodate for the way they measure fastballs changing. And I won't say who wins that, but it's not who you think through the hardest in Major League Baseball history. So I think anyone should go watch Fastball. Uh-huh. That's a tremendous, tremendous film. Um, I think for our documentary, we obviously wanted to, to – it's very important for me to make people remember how great my grandfather was on the field. But the other thing that we tried to do – was tell his full story. I mean, again, first-generation Italian immigrant. He's a war veteran. He was married to my grandmother for 65 years, and that love story is very front and center in this movie. So even if you are not a baseball fan, there's something that you can identify with in the film. You know, like many of us are sons and daughters of immigrants. Many of us are veterans. My Uncle Dale very openly talks about his drug addiction in the movie. We all know someone who struggles with addiction. Um, There was someone who came up to Sean Mullen, the director, after uh, 
our, our premiere at Tribeca and, you know, they read my grandmother's uh, love letters, the love letters my grandfather wrote to my grandmother. We read them in the film. And the man came up to Sean and said, you know, watching this movie is going to make me be nicer to my wife. Oh. And we were like, oh, my God. But at <laughs> least he took something good from the movie, right? So I do really think that there's something for everyone. And that was a big goal for us, to make it appeal to baseball fans, but to make it appeal to a much wider audience as well. I think with everything that is online or on the news, there's this is a positive thing. And then we turn to sports entertainment, really, for not drama. We, we go to the ballpark, whether it's two or three hours, or some people want to shorten that time span <laughs> nowadays. I don't know. But I say, hey, <laughs> but I say, you know, when you go, when you go find out what these people about, like your grandfather, and there's guys even today in today's game, there are there are guys that go out in the community, and I love the um, fact that you know the Roberto Clemente Award and the nominees that get to do that, you know, you get to put on a superhero cape, and I know your your grandfather did, and he did it so well, just as an individual and as a Yankee, but. It's it's really cool to see that you guys you know put something brilliant together, um, keep his legacy on for a long time. I know they'll be playing it at Cooperstown and everywhere else. I'm dying to see it. How how do we get to see that? When will this? Can you tell people where we can see this and how we can see it uh, as soon as possible? I'm dying to see it. I know. So the movie premieres in theaters in New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, tri-state area, and Los Angeles on May the twelfth. And then it's a what they call a platform release where they add a few cities each week after that. And honestly, the only one I know for sure right now is St. Louis on, I think, June 16th. Um, but I, I will be posting, if you want to check out my Twitter, at Lindsay Barra, every time I have a new piece of information, I will post it. The idea is to keep it strictly in theaters for a few months, probably through the summer, and then it will go to a streamer after that. So it may not be universally available yet but it will be i promise awesome. awesome that's that's so i i'm yeah i share in in jason's excitement when i say i cannot i cannot wait to see it. i'm a sucker for sports documentaries an even bigger sucker for baseball documentaries and i think one about one of the i think almost i don't know if it would be i mean you could almost just say one of the lesser known in terms of the public eye, when you think about the Yankees franchise, I mean, a lot of people, you think about Babe Ruth, you think about Mickey Mantle, but someone who was not only, you know, just as impactful on the field is Yogi Berra. So I think it's, it's well overdue to have, um, to have something about him, um, you know, make light like, like this, uh, especially, but, um, to sort of, um, to pivot off of that, Lindsay, I want to ask you too. um, because I think it's interesting to ask a lot of people who, you know, have grown up in families where, uh, you know, in families of someone who was as as impactful as someone like Yogi Berra, someone who's as well known as Yogi Berra. Um, what about what is it about? Because you're very successful in your own right, obviously, not to and, uh, you know, not to take away from that at all. What did you was there ever? you know, part of your mindset may be thinking about making a name for yourself uh, or was there, or maybe a mixture of making a name for yourself or continuing to build upon the legacy that, that your grandpa uh, started all, all those years ago. So it's funny, people ask me this a lot and, yeah. you know, you, you grow up and, you know, even on the softball field, you know, when you, if you make a mistake or something, some idiot yells from the stands, oh, your grandpa wouldn't have made that mistake. And my dad used to tell us the story. He was playing for the Marion Mets in the Mets minor league system. And some guy yelled, you'll never be as good a hitter as your father. And my dad just turned around and said, yeah, neither will you. So <laughs> it's like, you, there's always that, that kind of bar to um, live up to. And I think when I first started covering sports, I started working at ESPN magazine right out of college and I didn't want people to say, oh, you're Lindsay Barra, you got your job because of your grandfather. So I used to, first of all, I wasn't working in baseball at the time. I was covering mostly hockey and tennis and the Olympics and stuff. But I would introduce myself as Lindsay from ESPN. I wouldn't say my last name. Um, and it took me, I don't know, probably seven, eight years to kind of get over that. And honestly, as my grandfather got older, 
you know, you never want to think about losing your grandparents, but when the reality of that set in and I, and the museum was open and I got more and more involved with that, I was like, wait a minute, no, like I want his name out there. I want people to remember him. And then I kind of just really leaned into it. Um, and it's funny, I want to go back to something you said before about that Yankee uh, Mickey Mantle and, and Babe Ruth and whatever, because we are always asked about the Yankees Mount Rushmore, and it's always Mantle, Gehrig, uh, Ruth, and, um, oh my God. Who else DiMaggio. Is DiMaggio. And nobody, yeah, nobody ever puts Grandpa in that kind of company. And there's a couple things that I always say, like, there are only two players in Major League Baseball history with more than 350 home runs and fewer than 500 strikeouts. It's my grandfather and Joe DiMaggio. There are a handful of guys in history, like only only like about 20 who have ever hit, uh, or 20 seasons, where guys have hit more home runs than they've had strikeouts. Grandpa's the only catcher to have done that, and he did it five times. Five times. That's insane. Um, he led the Yankees in RBIs seven years in a row on a team that included Mickey Mantle. Um, people just kind of forget about how good he was. And it's astonishing to me. You know, he still has records, you know, most World Series hits, most World Series games played, World Series wins. No one's going to touch him in the postseason department ever. But he caught something like 184 str- uh, shutouts. That's never going to be d- caught. Um we just had last year Yadi Molina hit his thousandth RBI, and I remember the news story. I clicked on it. I think it was from Bleacher Report. I clicked on it on Twitter, and the this picture comes up. This composite photo says Yadi joins elite company, and it's uh, Johnny Bench, Pud Rodriguez, and Yadier, who all have a thousand RBIs. But in my head, I'm like, wait a minute, Grandpa has the most RBIs of any catcher in history, one thousand four hundred and thirty, and none of these guys. Yachty wasn't going to touch it in, at the end of, you know, with one more year to go. No way. And he literally wasn't even in the picture. And it's insane to me that people overlook him like that. So, anyway, soapbox. <laughs> no, it's it's incredible. And the, the thing that, Lindsay, I think one of the things that do I recall that you said that made your grandfather retire was he struck out three times in one game, which he did only, like, what? Once, twice, <laughs> and that is like—I mean, these players strike out. That 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 is one of my favorite stories to tell. So, so the grandpa's best year in the big leagues, by the way, I think was 1950. He hit 322. He had 28 home runs, 144 RBIs, 597 plate appearances, and he struck out 12 times. I mean, Not that's bad. bananas. 12 got guys today strike out 12 times in a weekend. <laughs> But that story that Jason is referring to, in 1965, Casey Stengel, who had been Grandpa's manager at the the Yankees, brought him over to be player coach with the Mets. And he played like, I don't know, 10 games or something in that season. May 10th was two days before his 40th birthday. And he struck out in a game three times on the same pitch, Tony Cloninger fastballs, which were allegedly not that impressive. And he was so mortified by his inability to make the adjustment that he retired immediately after the game. It was the second time in his career, only the second time they had struck out three times in a game. And he just called my grandmother and he was like, Carm, I couldn't catch up. I'm done. And could you imagine? Like, we'd have no one left in the big leagues if everyone everyone retired after they struck out three times. There'd be literally no one to play. Yeah, nobody. I know. You know, Gary Sheffield, who was a former Yankee, was is a, is a good friend of mine and my former agent, and he even said as the game was evolving, because uh, he's a little bit older than me, and, and just listening to him talk and his path uh, in the big leagues of just the, the evolution of hitting and how it became such a power game, I think in part due to the shift, guys just figured, hey, might as well launch because I'm just hitting into the shift. Yeah. Um, but he was astonished. He said, if we struck out ever, we were embarrassed. Like It was embarrassing. Mm-hmm. As it, it, him coming up even as a rookie, he's like, you had to put the ball in play. And that was something that was a precedence that, again, that's legacy stuff. When you were, you were borrowing the game and you got these veteran guys, you don't want to let down on your team. So I can only imagine, like you said, he was mortified because I know even way back then that was a thing that you did not want to strike out because you didn't want to go back to the bench. Uh, your goal and, and job was to at least put the ball in play, move a runner, 
Um, not just try to hit a three-run home run with nobody on base, which yeah. is some of the approach that some of these guys take. But, you know, again, these kids today, you know, this is something we do at Top 100 Sports and we teach. And I know we want to get to the mustard stuff that you're a part of, too, um, because part of the legacy that you know, the Barra family and you, Lynn's, um, are carrying on is, is, you know, we borrow this game and we want to leave it in good hands and we just want to remember – the people who were so awesome, the gracious, even myself, I, I, I can't even believe that I got to borrow it for as long as I did and, and pass the baton on because it's not, we don't own it, we borrow it. And mm -hmm. we try to just uh, honor, love and respect it, which your grandpa did. And I know you do because it's just talking, like I said, of doing everything that you carry on so wonderfully about what, what the Barra name is. So kudos to you on that. But tell us like your involvement transitioning into the Mustard app, which is a cool app. Um, that I know uh, I got to see at Nashville really, really cool. um, and, and, and play with it even with it's a really great app and it, and it helps because Tom House is involved in that pretty awesome stuff so this is another kind of thing for me that is in more more than just the app it's about a baseball legacy so Tom House was uh, he would tell you he was a fair to Midland big league pitcher but he pitched 13 years in the big leagues and he um became a pitching coach and went to school and has a bunch of advanced degrees. And he started doing biomechanical analyses of pitchers in the late seventies where they put the motion capture balls on you and you pitch. And a lot of big league teams still aren't doing that today. Right? So Tom had over 40 years of data and he also has Parkinson's disease. And I think he was really kind of facing the reality that if they didn't do something to preserve this data, it would be lost to history. So he teamed up with some entrepreneurs and some engineers from Baseball Advanced Media, Media and a lot of people who are smarter than I am, and they built an AI engine out of Tom's 40-plus years of biomechanical data um, that includes pitchers like Randy Johnson and Greg Maddox and Nolan Ryan. You know, really, the data set is just incredible. There's nothing like it in the baseball world. Um, so if you take a 2D video of your kid, uh, that 40 plus years of data gets overlaid and you get a biomechanical analysis based on 11 mechanical variables of the pitching delivery that the Mustard app has identified as being, you know, critical. And you get a plan to improve the um, variables that you are not the greatest at. And, you know, nowadays, I feel like baseball loses a lot of kids to a lot of other sports and pitching, pitching coaching is incredibly expensive to $300 an hour. And that is an obstacle for a lot of families. And the idea is um, to democratize elite level coaching so kids can see improvement because you have more fun when you get better. And th the bigger idea is to keep kids in the game by making them enjoy um, playing it more. And it's really been nice at this point in my career to do content for an app like that that's actually you can feel it and see it helping kids so it's been terrific it's such a cool it is really such a cool application and tom house is someone who i actually i first learned about him when i um i heard him speak on a uh on a on a podcast i was listening to a couple of years ago and uh, it was kind of when the mustard app was just starting to get implemented um and just kind of starting to gain some traction and get going um, and this was right towards the tail end of my kind of towards the tail end of my college pitching career. And I, God damn it. I wish I had that when I started pitching in college, because I don't want to say that, you know, I don't know if it would have made me any better, but man, by the time I got out, I was like, if I would have had this in high school and college. So, I, I mean, it is really just such a, such a cool application. And like you said, it makes, you know, allows you to have elite level coaching, you know, anywhere you go at, you know, at the palm of your hand, really. It's also cool. Like, you know, even if you're, you know, you're, if you're a kid, obviously it's helpful for you to get better, but if you're an elite level pitcher and you're tired or you hurt yourself, you're halfway through your season, you're feeling a little fatigued, whatever. If you're able to compare what you looked like, you know, three months prior to Absolutely. what you look like now in just a second without having to go into the lab and have all the little balls put on you, that's a really big tool. You know, you know, all right, my my head is off position. My stride is six inches shorter than it was. 
Um, my arm slot has has changed because my head is off position, and you can you can see that very quickly in the app and and be able to make those adjustments. And anybody who's been an athlete knows you can feel things to a certain extent, but if you can see it in front of you, you're like, oh, I get it, okay, and it makes it really easy to make those changes. Yeah, absolutely. It it is, you know, you talk about um, hand like I I think. It's one thing hearing a coach say things and and say, you know, this is what you have to do. This is what I'm seeing. And I, it's a little bit different, but I always remember one of the best pitching coaches I ever worked with. He was a right-handed. I was a right-handed pitcher. So was he. But when we would do our lessons, he was, he was so good at what he did in, in terms of his coaching. He would stand – there would be two mounds. He would stand right across from me and mirror what I was doing like as a lefty. Oh. So he did. He was able to do that to elevate his coaching, where he would just mirror my mechanics and show me. He was a better. He was able to have better mechanics as a left-handed pitcher, even though he was a dominant righty, to show me certain things, and that always stuck with me. And it's it's a similar thing. Being able to look at what you're doing just provides that much more support in your own your own advancement, no matter what level uh, you're doing it at. So it's incredible. That. That is amazing, by the way, like being yeah. able, my grandfather used to say he was amphibious and he meant ambidextrous and he was very much able to do things on, on both sides. But that is a, um, that is a, a quality that I do not possess. I tried to swing a golf club left-handed like four or five days ago and it just makes you feel like a complete moron. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was just going to say something about the, look. oh, the, the idea of, of having a pitching coach involved too, the Mustard app is not designed to make pitching coaches obsolete. It's also a great tool for them so they can, you know, when you look with your eyes, you see different things than when you can slow it down um, and, and look at that video frame by frame. So it is a great tool for, for coaches as well. Like I said, Jace, you know, the game continues to evolve. I, I wish that, you know, I could be a part of some of the stuff that is available now. You know, you sit there and you go, the older you get, the better yeah. you, you, you were. Right. So uh, maybe that's my, <laughs> the grillyism. I'll try to be like Yogi there. Uh, but no, I think, you know, the evolution of how you do it. And even as a father who's played in the big leagues, I'm trying to pass this, you know, baton on to my own kids or just some of their teammates. And some of these kids don't want to, you know, know the frequency because they're so involved technologically um, that it makes more sense to them and they can understand things digitally. And this, we're in the digital age. Uh, I just hope that AI doesn't take over where there's actual players <laughs> on the on the field still left. <laughs> change i don't want to watch it at all uh i want real human beings out there uh, how many ai things, but I, I think it's amazing <laughs> i said how many ai generated <laughs> players could you fit on one giant first base <laughs> <laughs> i think it, it's a pizza <laughs> you can first base have a slice of pizza i guess i don't know it's hilarious. I, I, one of the questions I want to ask you, Lindsay, before we let you go, and you have been just so generous with, with your time, and we appreciate you joining us so much to talk about everything that, that we have so far. But one of the, the things that I've, because I, I actually have a book, and I'm, the name is, I'm forgetting the name now, but it had a bunch of, the, it was like stories from the diamond. So it had a bunch of different baseball stories, and I used to read it all the time growing up. And there were, there was a plethora of Yogi Berra stories. Like there was a whole chapter dedicated to Yogi Berra. Um, and, and you mentioned it earlier and any baseball fan knows those yogiisms. Do you have a couple or maybe what, are there a couple that stand out to you that are maybe your favorite that you've heard maybe him say, or maybe ones that you've heard of and, or maybe one that's kind of off the, you know, maybe off the beaten path, a little underground one that people haven't heard as much that, that you want to share with us before we let you go here. Sure. This is going to be a long answer too. So I always say to people, I always say to people, the yogiisms resonate with so many people because there's truth in all of them, right? And they represent, I think, the way Grandpa looked at the world. He had this very simple way 
of looking at things where everything was black and white, right or wrong, yes or no. There were no areas of gray, and that came from the fact that he had this annoyingly forthright moral compass, right? If you wanted to know what the right thing to do was, go ask, talk to Grandpa for two minutes, and he would very much point out the right thing, and it stunk as a kid because the right thing is usually the hard thing to do, and you're like, oh, no, he's totally right. i got to do that. Um, but he was just very able to cut through the crap, and, you know, they say people can't see the forest for the trees. He just was very able to see all the trees, right? Um I like the existential yogiisms. Um, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. The future ain't what it used to be. Um, I do like when you come to a fork in the road, take it, which he was very specifically talking about a road that goes up to his house that splits into a Y, but both sides of the fork go to the road he lives on. So you could take either side and make a left, which so it makes perfect sense. But it has sort of become a euphemism in my family for like, get off your butt and do it. Like, you haven't done your homework yet? Take the fork, Lindsay, let's go. Like, so it, it, you kind of use it like that. Or if I'm dragging my feet, getting out to the garage to do my workout in the morning, take the fork, Lindsay. Um, but he really just had this logic. So I'll tell you two stories. I want, When I was working for ESPN Magazine, I went out and did a, a, a story on a tennis player. And my grandmother used to put little post-it notes on all my stories so my grandfather would know where they were and he could read them. And then I, um, when I was in my 20s, I was playing, 20s and 30s, I was playing in a soccer club. And after soccer games, I would go to their house and eat their leftovers because it was convenient. And I walk in and grandpa's uh, flipping through the magazine, reading my stories. And he, he points to the page, bangs on it, and he says, this kid this kid is handsome. You should date him. And I said, I can't date him, Grandpa. He dates a swimsuit model. And without even thinking about it, he goes, you've got swimsuits. And he was right. I do, in fact, have <laughs> swimsuits. But like I said, with Grandpa, there is no gray area. So in his mind, there was no difference between me in a swimsuit and a swimsuit model. So it just perfectly, you know, tells you how he looks at things, right? Um, and then my other favorite story that is um, lesser known Whoa. in late 50s when Grandpa and Mickey Mantle became pitchmen for Yoo-Hoo chocolate drink. I always make sure to say drink because it is definitely not milk. There's not a shred <laughs> of dairy in that stuff. Um, he he uh, became pitchmen. They became pitchmen for Yoo-Hoo. And there was a female reporter in the front row of a Yoo-Hoo press conference. And Grandpa always remembered this because there weren't a lot of women reporters at the time. And she raised her hand and she said, excuse me, is that carbonated? Meaning Yoo-Hoo chocolate drink. And Grandpa said, lady, it ain't... Oh my God, I messed it up. He said, she said, excuse me, is that hyphenated? And he said, lady, it ain't even carbonated. <laughs> I messed up my story. Um, but anyway, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very funny story whether I messed it up or not. Um, but yeah, it really was the way Grandpa talked. And it was very just indicative of the way he looked at the world. Incredible. Man. Oh, man. Uh, like I said, you, you are, you, it's, it's a gift that honestly, I mean, I'm, I'm friends with you, but Liz, to keep, these stories alive you know them so well i know you said you screwed it up no you told it beautifully because mm -hmm. there's no one uh, i know that knows it as well as you do um and if you haven't been to the yogi Berra museum this year if you're going to the new york tri-state area you gotta go um it's a, a wonderful place um go check it out it's a lot of great things happening Lens, if there's anything we can do for you, like I said, I always love jamming with you, um, always doing some great things, keeping that legacy alive. It's inspiring to me. It should be inspiring to these kids today. Um, I know when that documentary comes out midsummer, uh, right when baseball is at its, at its pinnacle, I think it's going to be good timing, and uh, I hope that people really come out and appreciate who he was as a man, human being, and definitely as a ball player. Um, his legacy definitely lives on, and it does at that museum. So thank you so much for coming on. First woman uh, interview as well today with Woo! Top 100 on uh, my segment, Mount Visit. So be who better to have than you? It's It's been awesome. Thank you guys so much for, for having me. And uh, one thing I will just throw out there before you leave, like I was, I was very lucky to have my grandparents, both of them, um, 
until I was 37 and 39 years old or something. And I know a lot of kids today think about their grandparents. Maybe if you don't have that kind of adult relationship with them, if you're 12 years old, you think of them as the folks who give you presents on Christmas and you see them a few times a year or whatnot. But they've been on this earth a long time and it doesn't matter if they're professional baseball players or school teachers or accountants they have a lot to share because they've seen a lot and I think a lot of us take our grandparents for granted but it's so rewarding if you just sit down and have a conversation with them about their life and where they've been and learn about who they are and what made them who they are today and anybody can do that you don't have to have a famous grandpa to appreciate your grandparents. Absolutely. Really, really well said. I, I think I'll, I'll take this opportunity to shout out my grandpa who I know and my grandma who I know are watching. So um, it, it really great. And again, Lindsay, thank you so much for taking the time to come on before we let you go. Remind everybody if you want to see more, more content like this and especially right here on International Women's Day, what a great time it was, like Jason said, to have our, our, our first female guest on the podcast. I couldn't think of a better name to have. So Um, Thank you so much for tuning in. Subscribe to the Top 100 Sports Network. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And you can listen to this on Spotify and Apple Music if you want to just listen to that. And um, we'll have to talk with Lindsay again soon, especially when that documentary comes out. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in to The Mound Visit. And uh, we will catch you next week. Mm